Hello, this is John Baugh, and I'm your instructor for CIS 1500 Java Programming 1. Um, I believe it's listed as software engineering with Java, but primarily this is a course uh, as an introduction uh, to Java programming uh, with some software engineering principles mixed in. Um, we'll go over the syllabus since uh, last week there was very minimal um, interaction at the college because of uh, because of the uh, nasty weather that we had. So we'll go over quickly, go over the syllabus, and then get into the lecture. Um, firstly, uh, firstly, we have uh, the uh, syllabus, the when and the where. The course is entirely online, um, except for the test. And I will have lectures and materials uploaded each week by Friday. This will often include um, a video lecture and sometimes other supplemental materials and other things. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm John Baugh. Um, I have a master's degree in computer science and I'm currently working on a PhD in information systems engineering. Um, I'm one of four full-time faculty here at the Orchard Ridge campus. There are in the uh, entire CIS discipline across campuses, I believe there are 12 or 13 uh, CIS instructors, but uh, or full-time CIS instructors, but I'm one of the four in the department at Orchard Ridge. My office is room F117 on the Orchard Ridge campus, um, and these are my office hours. Uh, Tuesday, 8.25 a.m. to 8.55 a.m., uh, 1.30 to uh, 5.30 p.m., then Wednesday also uh, at uh, about 30 minutes before a class I teach, and then same thing with Thursday. Then I have an hour of, uh, have an hour of class before, um, or an hour of uh, office hours right after the class that I teach on Thursday, and then I have online office hours here. That means I'll be ex uh, extra attentive to my email and also if you need to um, do a Google Hangout with me or things like that, we can, uh, we can arrange for that. Um, and there is a note that the office hours are subject to change. Uh, often you might catch me even at other times uh, during the night um, at completely different times. So my email is jpbaugh at oaklandcc.edu. So if you have to get a hold of me, please use uh, that email. Um, uh, one other thing I guess I should mention about myself is that after I, uh, while I was working my master's degree, um, I worked at the Vehicular Networking Research Laboratory that I uh, founded actually at the University of Michigan Dearborn, and um, after that I was hired at Siemens PLM Software, um, working in their uh, licensing and business intelligence division, so I worked basically on software components and um, both server and client side components that uh, um, uh, help with the licensing system to ensure that the uh, extremely expensive software that the company sells, CAD software, primarily CAD and uh, uh, team productivity software, was not uh, free. Uh, the course objectives in this particular course, uh, CIS 1500, students will be introduced to the fundamental techniques and syntax for understanding, designing, constructing, and testing object-oriented programs by studying the Java programming language. The structured programming basics of processes, selection, and iteration uh, will be covered as well as primitive and complex data typing, methods, parameters, and input-output. The basics of graphical user interface, also known as GUI programming, such as event handling, windows, and widgets, will be introduced. Fundamental object-oriented concepts of classes, methods, abstraction, encapsulation, and inheritance, and incorporating an existing applet onto a web page will also be introduced. Uh, students will be required to complete computer-based assignments inside and outside of class. Well, since this is online, it's pretty much all outside of class. So, uh, prerequisites. You should have elementary algebra skills and be familiar with both elementary word processing and Windows file management techniques prior to enrolling in the class. Um, if you're using a Mac, uh, that's fine too, um, or Linux or what have you, because Java is cross-platform. We'll talk about that later. Um, the textbooks for, textbook for the class um, is a textbook with a picture of a watermelon on it, uh, so you know you've got the right version. 
it's the fifth edition of starting out with Java from control structures through objects. Okay, you don't want the don't want an early objects version or anything like that. Um, you could suffice with a different uh, Java book, I suppose, but this is this is the one we will be using for the class. Um, the ISBN number is listed here, so if you have any questions, um, this prevents you from getting the wrong one or looking at the wrong one. So, the topics covered. Um, fundamental topics will be fundamentals of computer hardware and software and fundamentals of programming. We will also go into the introduction. We also um, introduce you to the Java programming language. I'll introduce you to the Eclipse uh, integrated development environment. We'll go over decision, also known as selection control structures. We will also go over iterative, also known as repetition control structures or loops. We will discuss standard input output, file input output methods, um, arrays and array lists, introduction to object-oriented programming, classes, inheritance, and we will also look at GUI applications. Uh, the website, um, if you've found the uh, syllabus and found this video, it is quite likely that you've already found desire to learn but supplementary information will be available uh, via desire to learn um, You go to oaklandcc.edu and click on distance learning this is where the PowerPoint, slides, class announcements, course syllabi, test dates, handouts, and other information uh, will be. We also have a requirement that you get um, email, and you should use the email through the uh, college. Um, it's very, very difficult um, to keep track of uh, who's contacting me and what's going on if you don't identify yourself in an email, so please do so. Please identify yourself and tell me what class you're in, because I do. I am teaching currently six classes, um, so asking me something about a particular homework assignment, it may not click unless you tell me what class you're in. Grading and evaluation. Programming Project 1 is worth 100 points. We'll talk about that. Programming Project 2 and 3 are both worth 125 points each. The capstone project, which is the, comp uh, the final project um, of the class, is 200 points. You will have a midterm examination. That's the only one that you will uh, come in in person or find a proctor. Um, so if you, if you can't make it to campus on the day that we'll have the midterm, um, then don't sweat it. We will work out something, but you need to get a, a proctor, which means that um, an individual either at another campus um, if you absolutely live way too far, like, um, you know, sometimes we get students from as far as Africa. Uh, if you cannot make it to Oakland Community College, you have to get your exam proctored. Um, we will also have optional uh, homework. It will vary in the number of points. They will s generally be significantly less than these. Um, and it depends on uh, how I'm feeling or what I uh, think we should study. Um, uh, during the uh, during the weeks and the months ahead. Projects and homework. Oh, also, we have the standard grading scale here with the percentages. You can look at that at your leisure, but 95 to 100 is an A, and obviously failing is below 60. That's your F. Um, everything in between is pretty pretty typical, pretty standard. Uh, the projects and homeworks, as I, as I mentioned before, there's four programming projects. Um, it should have an S, sorry including one capstone project to grow your skill at programming and problem solving. Additional homework will be assigned at my discretion and may include questions, research, or small programming activities. Um, the late policy, policy on late homework, um, assignments will be accepted up until 11.59 of the due date without penalty. Any assignment submitted after the due date is considered late. 5% deduction will be applied for every day that the assignment's late. And then after five business days, the assignment will no longer be accepted unless I approve such an exception. Now, I'm generally pretty lax with this. If you, I understand that life happens and things uh, come up and there are often problems. Um, you know, people have all kinds of problems and reasons uh, for maybe not, um, not turning in something exactly on time. If you turn it in five minutes late past midnight, I'm not going to freak out. Uh, sometimes people forget to upload stuff. I understand things happen, so I'm going to be very reasonable. But I can also, I'm also pretty good at by this point at telling when I'm getting played. 
so don't mess with me and you'll be fine. Um, 16 week tentative course outline. The semester dates, this is the entire semester. Um, this goes from the Monday that we actually were closed until the end of the semester, the 28th, which I believe is on a Monday also. Uh, yep, that's on a Monday as well. Um, we will probably end the end of the semester for us and have everything due um, within the week. We'll talk about due dates as the programs uh, come along. But um, here's the general syllabus. Syllabus. Hopefully, um, you were able to get into D2L and kind of overview some of the stuff that I wrote and download Eclipse at eclipse.org. Um, Eclipse is an integrated development environment. Uh, you need to go to um, the eclipse.org website and then all you have to do is click on downloads and then it's the one at the very top. Um, Windows 32 is fine to download. That should work on all Windows uh, platforms. Uh, Windows 64, if you have a 64-bit operating system, feel free to do that. But I would say just, just get the Windows 32 and you'll be safe. Um, this week, we are going to uh, look at computer programming. Um, I put and Eclipse here, but we really won't spend too much time in Eclipse. We'll basically do an introduction uh, to computer programming and um, also computers and also basics of uh, basics of Java itself. So it won't just be on programming today. We're going to do an overview of what, why is programming necessary, what are the different components of a computer, etc. Uh, next week, next two weeks, we'll go over the fundamentals of Java and at on the week of the 27th, you will have your programming project uh, number one assigned. It will be relatively simple. Uh, it will be due on Valentine's Day at 11.59 p.m. The next one, um, on the third, we'll start on decision structures. And then um, the following week, we'll do the same thing. This will be Chapter 3 coverage for the, both of those weeks. And then the Programming Project 1 will be due that week. This is a reminder I put in red just to make sure everyone knows. Following that, we will look at Loops and Files, which are um, Chapter 4, which is Chapter 4. Programming Project 2 will be assigned, and that's due Friday, March, uh, Friday, March 14th. And also, I'm telling you on uh, this day to study for the midterm. Um, I apologize that this got uh, cut out of the next page, but pay attention here. It's study for midterm on March 4th. Uh, the midterm occurs when we get back from break. So the week of the 24th, there will be no lecture. Um, when we get back from break, we will have the midterm. I will announce days and times. I will give multiple days and times so that you can uh, come in at relatively convenient uh, times for you if you are around. Um, if not, uh, we will arrange something uh, for proctoring for you. Um, then after that, on the 10th, we will do a brief overview of what we covered before and then uh, progress in loops and files. At that point, your Programming Project 3 will be assigned. That's due in April, April 4th. And then uh, Programming Project 2 will be due that week on the 14th. We'll then go into Methods and then take a first look at Classes, Arrays and Array List. And this week, the week of March the 31st, so it could be the first couple days in April, your Capstone Project will be assigned and it will be due um, essentially the last uh, day of class within the last day. It'll be due April the 25th, um, so you do not have until Monday the 28th to complete it. You will have until the Friday the 25th, but notice you do get uh, several weeks to work on, on this one. Three, so this week, rest of this week, then one, two, and three. So you do get plenty of time to work on it, um, and it won't be it won't be that bad, but it should culminate with a lot of uh, techniques that we learned in class. Um, <clears throat> on the 7th, the week of the 7th, we will uh, go over chapter 10 and then start on chapter 12. And then these three weeks uh, basically will be focused on GUI applications and also um, what I called instructor's choice topics and capstone work. So basically you will be able to work on your capstone. I won't give you a ton of extra material. And as a note, there's no final examination. 
So there's no final examination for the class. There is a midterm, but there's no final examination. Um, I, for my programming courses, I generally um, don't assign uh, a major test at the end. I consider the projects more important. So I want you to focus on your project. Um, I'm, more imp I'm more interested in seeing what you can produce with the projects rather than uh, regurgitating information. Although it's important to memorize some things and it's important to become fluent speaking <clears throat> as a programmer and a computer scientist, software engineer, um, it is more important at this level that you understand some of the concepts and that you can um, uh, you can work and produce programs that work and that are well written. The policy on computer resources, basically this section is just saying um, don't uh, don't look at things that you shouldn't be looking at on the campus computers and don't use them for any illegal activity. Um, just use them for stuff that has to do with your schooling. Policy on plagiarism. If I think you're uh, cheating, um, I now I don't mind if you get help obviously from the uh, tutors that are on campus. Uh, things like that, or if you get help from me, obviously it's not cheating. Um, but you should not uh, just let someone else do the work for you. Okay, and uh, often it's easy for it's relatively easy for me to tell if that's the case. Um, ADA notification: If you have disabilities and you need special assistance, um, you should contact the access office and inform me of any special conditions pertaining to your learning experience. Um, that's This is mostly if you'll be on campus, but you might want to contact them and get uh, an official diagnosis or something. Even if you have one, you need to register with access. If you have any kind of physical, emotional, mental, any kind of di uh, disability that will cause you to uh, need maybe extra time on a test or um, any other special considerations, uh, then you should contact ACCESS. <clears throat> FERPA. FERPA is the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, and basically this, this just means that I can't tell um, any of your personal information, including grades, um, attendance, which isn't really relevant uh, to the online uh, course, because you're either watching the videos or you're not. Um, and I can't tell anyone any of this information without written consent. Your homework and your grades will be on um, desire to learn so there's really not a huge problem I don't keep it in a paper grade book here so you need to um, if you need to show someone your grades you can log into your desire to learn and then show them under grades uh, there are tutors available um, in the CIS labs in F building, we're talking about Orchard Ridge campus. Um, I know that our tutors do tutor Java. I believe that a couple of the other campuses, perhaps Auburn Hills, maybe Royal Oak may have tutors that do Java as well. Um, they should be able to help you. Um, several of them do tutor in CIS 1500. So the disclaimer is that I can change this syllabus if I uh, think it needs to be changed. I could, for example, extend a deadline for an assignment. Um, I can change what I need to change. I'm not going to change the class into an underwater basket weaving con uh, course or something stupid. Um, this is just to give me some leeway so that I can modify it. And obviously, since the homework, the besides the programming projects, the miscellaneous homework is not listed here. Um, if we uh, if we do have any, um, so I will I do reserve the right to assign that as well. So it's not a, it's not listed explicitly. All right, I'm going to take a couple minute break, and then we'll get back to it. Okay, so um, so I'm back. I may take an occasional uh, break. Um, I, I've had a little bit of a cold lately, so I, I try not to go into a coughing fit on the microphone. So if anything like that occurs, um, or if you hear me pause for a minute, don't be alarmed. I'm alive, hopefully. Um, so. Uh, this week, um, I want to I want you to make sure that you download and install or are able to install um, Eclipse. So Eclipse looks like this. This is Kepler a version called Kepler. Um, when you 
when you first start Eclipse, Eclipse, it asks you what workspace you want to be a part of, and you choose a workspace. Now, what a workspace is is just a folder. When you first start out, you just have to create a folder um, somewhere uh, that you trust. Uh, typically, this will be on your maybe on your desktop or in your, my documents. Um, for me, I created a folder in OCCOR Winter 2014 CIS 1500, and then I have one called Workder. Now, you select that as your uh, workspace for Eclipse. The workspace is basically just a collection. Um, it will be a collection of um, projects that you have for the particular um, uh, in the particular workspace available to you. Now, what this what happens with Eclipse um, is that Eclipse basically has a, a code editor involved in it. So the text editor, which will be displayed in the center here, it has a compiler, it has a debugger, it has everything you need uh, basically to make uh, to make programs work. It actually automatically compiles as you go along. Um, there are other IDEs available. In fact, one of the um, one of the instructors here, a couple of the instructors here uh, at OCC on various campuses use a program called JGRASP. So JGRASP, J-G-R-A-S-P. Um, it's a lot more what I would consider, um, this isn't meant insulting, but it's a lot more dumbed down. Um, it isn't a full-fledged IDE, really. It's um, basically got um, no bells and whistles. You basically write the code. You don't have a project or anything. You, you load the code file into memory, and then it it's sits thinly on top of the Java compiler. Um, Eclipse, on the other hand, is very full-featured. It is industry, uh, industry level software. It's used um, in very uh, in different variations. It's used uh, across the industry in Java development. Eclipse, NetBeans um, are two very very popular um, IDEs. Uh, IntelliJ also um, is very popular. But I choose Eclipse because Android, most Android development that I've done and that most of the people I know do are in Eclipse. And also Eclipse is, just seems to be the favorite of most of the industries that I've um, had any experience with around the area. I know CompuWare uses Eclipse and several other uh, companies do as well. So uh, any Android development you're going to be doing, uh, say if you want to be a mobile developer in the future, you'll, uh, Eclipse is a great platform for Android development as well, but it's a great platform for any kind of Java development. BlackBerry uses a BlackBerry. Uh, Berry is also another mobile platform. Uh, they have a version of Eclipse that they release, and um, you can use it for your BlackBerry development as well. But uh, it's not just a mobile uh, development environment. In fact, Eclipse has been around for quite a while in different uh, different versions, and was around way before the mobile. Uh, revolution really came around. Um, so this week, according to the syllabus, we'll always check the syllabus. Uh, we're doing an introduction to computer programming and Eclipse. So I kind of showed you Eclipse a little bit. Um, in Eclipse, you have packages. You create new Java projects, essentially. Um, and then you can run the code based on that. We'll maybe take a look at that in just a little bit. Um, I will upload the Chapter 1 um, the chapter one um, uh, slides for the uh, the text uh, to desire to learn under the under an appropriate um, lecture or under an appropriate uh, location. Um, in fact, I will show you where we'll put it so you can have confidence that it's there. I'll upload it right now. So we have distance learning. Log into desire to learn. Then you type your username and your password. You log in and to select a course, um, since you found the course, I'm assuming you know how to get here, but um, this is a little different than the interface was before. That's because they've uploaded <clears throat> um, or they've upgraded to 10.2, Desire to Learn 10.2. Uh, we select a course and then I'm going to go to the Intro to Software Engineering Java. Um, under here, content is where you will have your uh, your lecture slides. Um, you'll note that I haven't current uh, I have currently put the lecture one instructions and also the syllabus. 
um, but we'll say that this is now lecture two. So we've got lecture two folder. Um, you won't be able to add folders, but you'll note on the table of contents you'll have a lecture two folder. And then um, I will upload the chapter one material to that uh, folder. So new upload files. I'm going to Go here, go to the slides, and I'm going to upload chapter one uh, file. So once it's done uploading, I'm going to click add. And now, easy as that, just like that, you have your chapter one uh, files for the Gaddis book available to you. All right, pretty easy. So you've got that there. All you have to do is go to it and download. Uh, click the little arrow and download, and you'll be all set. All right, so chapter one, introduction to computers and Java, from starting out with Java from control uh, structures through objects. Um, it contains various topics, including a uh, brief introduction, and then also why program, why do we even bother programming? Uh, why do we need programmers? We'll go over computer systems, hardware and software, programming languages. What is a program made of? The programming process, object-oriented program. So, um, Java's history is quite uh, quite interesting. It's very extensive. We won't go over the extensive um, uh, description of the uh, history. But in 1991, uh, there was a team uh, called the Green Team at Sun Microsystems. And uh, basically, they wanted to uh, get together and look at what the important technological trends uh, that might emerge in the near future, and they decided, uh, they determined that computers would eventually merge with consumer electronics, so consumer appliances, consumer electronics, etc. So their first project was to develop a handheld device that they called Star 7. Um, they wanted this device to be able to use to control a variety of home entertainment devices. In order for the unit to work, it had to use a programming language that could uh, be processed by all the devices it controlled. But that's a problem um, because these the different brands of consumer devices use different processors, each with its own machine language. And the way most programming languages work is you compile the source code, which is what you write in the source code for um, C, C++, for example. And when you compile it, it turns directly into a an executable file uh, which is ultimately in the machine code, the zeros and ones ultimately, that that particular processor understands. So for example, the, uh, an Intel processor using, an, you know, using the um, x86 or the x64 language versus um, a RISC processor or what have you, um, all these different types of processors floating around, but they all have their own machine language. So that's a problem. These embedded systems, these uh, consumer electronics, consumer appliances, um, all uh, may have different processors, and each of those has its own machine language. So no universal language existed. So James Gosling, who is the team's lead engineer, created one. Um, originally, this language was called Oak. Um, it was originally called Oak because there, uh, I don't believe this is in the book, but there, uh, from what I understand, there was an Oak outside the office. Um, they were having, um, they would always meet and discuss this, uh, this language and all the, uh, things they were going to do, and they would see this giant tree out in front of where Sun Microsystems was, and it was an oak, so they named the language Oak. Um, Java-enabled web browser uh, came later, so the, the language was, uh, the book says something to the effect of um, they wanted to demonstrate the effectiveness of the language, so they changed the name to Java. Um, I've also heard that one of the, that, I mean, that's a good reason, but they also left out the fact that um, there was another programming language already named Oak. So when they found out there was already a language named Oak, they changed the name. The reason they named it Java is because um, a lot of computer scientists are powered by Java. Okay, they're powered by uh, coffee and caffeine. And in order to, um, in order to produce uh, software, a lot of uh, computer scientists will stay at it for several hours in a row and they need caffeine to stay awake. So <clears throat> Java, had an, uh, there was a Java enabled web browser called Hot Java. It was demonstrated at the 1995 Sun World Conference and it had a lot of 
attention. Uh, so uh, people were very, very impressed with this. Um, Java's cross-platform, which means it can run on various computer operating systems. There are two types of programs, uh, primarily two types of programs that you can write in Java. These two types are called applications and applets. Okay, applications and applets. Applications are standalone programs that run with, uh, out the aid of a web browser. There's a relaxed security model, oops, relaxed security model since the user runs the program locally. Applets, on the other hand, uh, will load inside of a Java-enabled web browser, like Internet Explorer, Microsoft, uh, I'm sorry, Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome. Uh, when you have a Java-enabled web browser and you run it, um, you're going to uh, you're going to run the applet inside the web browser. Since um, a, an applet is obtained from a web server, uh, a lot of people are, are a little bit leery of uh, you know what to do with that because they're thinking, well maybe someone's going to infect my computer because you're running a you know a huge amount of code on my computer. So what's the problem? Uh, is that um, you know they could they could transmit the uh, virus or whatever. Um, but basically, uh, Java is designed. The Java enabled browsers are designed so that the um, Java applets cannot do harmful things like deleting the contents of your hard drive or transmitting private information to another computer. Uh, the web browsers that run the Java applets are run them in a secure environment so that the uh, computer memory, they uh, it's run in the computer memory and it doesn't allow you to access resources such as the disk drive that are outside that environment. So, um, well, why do we program or why program? Um, computers um, are tools. Okay, every industry has its tools, um, and uh, many, um, you know, many industries like uh, you know mechanics will have tools that they use to work on cars. Um, bakers have uh, tools essentially that they use to uh, make uh, cake and pastries and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, there's all kinds of tools uh, available. You, know, you have electronic technicians that use probes, scopes, and meters. Carpenters use hammers, saws, and measuring tapes, etc. Some tools are very, very specific to a field. For example, there are many surgical tools that are really only used by a particular surgeon. Um, something to retract uh, uh, muscles and, uh, and fat and uh, hold bones in place and things like that. Some of these things are very, very specific to an industry, in this case surgery. Um, but some are extremely uh, universal, like they're used in several pro uh, professions. For example, screwdrivers and hammers are used by uh, mechanics, carpenters, and many other people. Even though there might be different, uh, different types of screwdrivers and hammers, uh, these are used by many different people. The computer may be one of the most versatile um, tools that ever existed so because they can be they're used by many professions and they can also be programmed which means they can be told what to do uh, computers are tools that can be programmed to perform many functions such as allowing you to interact with spreadsheets database and word processing uh, you can be entertained with games and all uh, sorts of things so um, since they can be uh, specially programmed um, you also need someone to do the programming. So computer programmers are the ones that implement the programs that perform these functions. Aspects of a computer program that must be designed, the logical flow of the instructions, because ultimately all you're doing is telling the computer what to do, the mathematical procedures, the layout of the programming statements, the appearance of the screens, so that has to do with design if you're working in a GUI application or an application that ha like PowerPoint, has um, tabs and buttons and all kinds of things that you can interact with, um, you need to decide the appearance of the screens. So that's part of the design. The way the information is presented to the user, the program's user friendliness, um, do you make the user dig through seven layers just to get to a button that they needed to press at the beginning? That's probably a bad user interface design. So user friendliness um, is very important. Uh, manuals, help systems, and other forms of written documentation are also part of, uh, or aspects of computer programming. 
programs must be analytically correct as well. Programs rarely work the first time they're programmed, especially larger uh, programs. That goes for that's not just for novices or people just learning to program. Um, this is true of anyone who's a programmer, um, including experts. Um, rarely does everything work the way you expected the first time through, especially when you're dealing with thousands of lines of code. Um, some of them you may not have written, and some of them that may be poorly documented that you're trying to use, um, but you have to use because uh, you know they're buried somewhere uh, that's a crucial part of the code. So not everything's always pretty. Um, programmers must perform the following on a continual basis. Uh, they have to analyze, experiment, correct, and redesign. Um, programming languages have strict rules known as the syntax that must be carefully followed. So the syntax is like the grammar uh, of, the, of the programming language, just like natural languages like English and Spanish, French, German, Arabic, Chinese. Um, they all have syntax. They all have grammar rules that have to be followed. The same thing goes for a programming language. Programming languages syntax looks a little bit different. Um, the natural languages, but it still has a syntax. So the syntax are the strict rules that the program has to follow. Um, hardware, computer hardware components are the physical pieces of the computer. The um, major hardware components of a computer are the main or the central processing unit, main memory, secondary storage devices, and then input devices and output devices. So there are five major uh, hardware components. And this is a little bit of a diagram of how everything interacts with the computer. Um, ultimately, the computer is um, here. Um, input devices are any device that sends signals into the computer. And output devices are devices that receive signals from the computer. For example, um, a webcam sends data into the into the computer, ultimately to the main memory and central processing unit, or CPU. Joystick, keyboard, mouse, scanner, uh, writing tablet, uh, camera. You're sending data into the com into the computer. Um, output devices like the monitor, the printer, and the speakers. Speakers are for audio. Printer is to uh, create paper versions of the digital documents that you have on your computer. And the monitor displays <clears throat> items on your computer in a format that you can see as a human being. It is important to note, however, that a particular device does not necessarily have to be... <clears throat> excuse me. The different devices that um, interact with the computer um, or are part of a computing environment do not necessarily have to be... Uh, just an input or just an output device. Sometimes they can be both. If you think of a controller for many video game system uh, console systems like the Xbox 360 controller, um, it's actually input and output. It's primarily an input device, but if something explodes uh, and you're in a battle or uh, something whooshes past you really fast, uh, the rumble packs or the motors inside of the Xbox 360 controller on either side will vibrate. Okay, so it's the computer, i.e. the Xbox 360, will be sending data to the controller. Okay, same thing goes for um, other environments as well. Um, your smartphone is another example. If you hold your smartphone up, you can see um, stuff being displayed to you from the smartphone, like apps and things you're interacting with. But you can also input into the, or give input into the smartphone by touching it, because it uh, has a touch screen. The central processing unit is the brain of the computer. Um, it's a very, very important part um, of the computer, and it um, has a instructions going into the uh, CPU instructions and data, and it also uh, produces output. Okay, so it's basically the heart of the computer or the brain. It's got two different components, major component areas in the CPU. There uh, is the control unit, uh, which coordinates uh, the computer's operations. And then you have the arithmetic logic unit, or ALU, um, which 
um, it does exactly what it says it does. It performs logical and mathematical operations. Um, and then you have a result being produced. Um, the CPU performs what is called the fetch decode execute cycle in order to process program information. So the CPU's control unit uh, fetches uh, from, from what we call main memory. We'll look at that in a second. That's the RAM. Okay. The next instruction in the sequence of program instructions. Um, the instruction is encoded in the form of a number. And the control unit decodes the instruction and generates an electronic signal. Okay. So that's the decode portion. Then the signal is routed to the appropriate component of the computer, such as the arithmetic logic unit, which is part of the CPU also. It could be a disk drive, because it could be a write command. Maybe it should write to the disk drive some sort of information, or some other device. The signal causes the component to perform a particular operation. So that's the fetch decode execute cycle. Uh, well, we talked about main memory, so when the CPU pulls an instruction out of memory, it pulls it out of main memory. Um, this is commonly known as uh, random access memory or RAM. Sometimes people call it just memory. If someone just says memory, they're usually almost always talking about um, RAM or main memory. RAM contains currently running programs and then the data used by those programs. So it's live. It's in. It's uh, just like we have this PowerPoint presentation going on, and I have Camtasia running, and Eclipse running, and uh, Adobe PDF running, uh, or Adobe Reader running with a PDF loaded. Uh, this is all in RAM. I've got a whole lot of other programs that I'm not currently running, such as Microsoft Word, uh, Visual Studio, Unity, uh, Mozilla Firefox. I have a lot of things that I'm not running currently. That's uh, on the long-term storage device, or secondary storage device, the hard drive of my uh, computer, but it's not in main memory because it's not currently running. Um, RAM is divided into units called bytes. A byte is a uh, series of eight bits, but the bytes are the smallest addressable unit in memory. Um, if you're not familiar with what a bit is, you can think of it as um, a set of switches with on or off. So a one could be an on, a zero could be off, and they form a pattern. So this particular pattern right here would be 01001101, okay? They're kind of like that. They can be thought of as switches. And in fact, um, the bytes in memory on the RAM are assigned unique numbers called an address. Um, these bits form a pattern that represents a character or a number, um, other data. RAM is what we call volatile. That doesn't mean it insults your mother or slashes your tires because it's angry. Volatile means that as long as it has power going to it, it's fine. But if you cut off the power, the contents of the main memory uh, RAM are erased. Main memory can be visualized as a column or row of cells. These are addresses over to the side. Okay. Uh, usually if you see 0x in front of something, it implies that it's uh, in hexadecimal, and often hexadecimal is used for memory locations. Um, <clears throat> a section of memory. These sections of memory are called bytes, and then the byte, again, is made up of 8 bits. section of 2 or 4 bytes is often called a word. So what about secondary storage devices? Um, as I said, main memory refers to RAM. A lot of people get confused and say, you know, if someone asks them, how much memory does your computer have, they say, oh, well, I've got a terabyte hard drive. Well, that's not really what they're asking. If they ask about memory, they're asking about main memory, RAM. Okay, so usually you have, you know, you might have 4 gig or 8 gig, 12 gig, whatever you have for RAM. That's usually significantly less than your uh, secondary storage devices, uh, which are sometimes called uh, mass storage devices or just storage devices. Um, these types of devices are non-volatile, so that means that if I type, if I start typing a letter, it's in main memory, and then I hit save, and I save it to the hard drive, then that is then uh, that copy up to that point is saved in a non-volatile fashion. So as long as nothing, you know, major, uh, majorly wrong happens to the hard drive or the flash drive or what have you, um, then the data is safe. 
common secondary uh, storage devices are hard drives. Uh, floppy drives are almost never used anymore. Um, CDRW drive, CD-ROM, DVD RAM drive, um, and compact flash card, okay, or flash drives, SD cards, for example. Input is any data the computer collects from the outside world, like I mentioned before. So data that comes from these devices, uh, devices is known as input devices. Um, I'm sorry, the devices that the data comes from from the outside world are known as input devices. So these common input devices are keyboard, mouse, scanner, digital camera. Um, output is any data that the computer sends to the outside world. And the data that is displayed on these devices is known as um, output devices. So common output devices are monitors and printers. Some devices, such as disk drives, perform input and output, and these are called input-output devices, so they can do both. All right. Uh, software is uh, the hard, whereas the hardware are the tangible components, the components of a computer that you can touch. The software includes the components that are not tangible. So software refers to the programs that run on a computer. There are two classifications of software. You have operating system, or what we call system software. It's the operating system and the support utilities. And then application software. In a nutshell, the operating system has two functions. It controls the system resources and provides the user with a means of interaction with the computer. Operating systems can either be single tasking or multitasking. Most modern operating systems are multitasking. A single tasking operating system is capable of only running one program at a time. An example would be the disk operating system called DOS. It's an old, old uh, single task OS. Multitasking operating system is capable of running multiple programs at once, such as Windows, various flavors of Windows and Unix, uh, Mac OS. Um, uh, operating systems can also be categorized as single user or multi user. A single user operating system allows only one user to operate the computer at, at a time. Multi user systems allow there to be several users running the programs and operate the computer at once. So examples of single-user systems would be DOS, and then Windows 95, 98, and ME. Examples of uh, multi-user operating systems are even old versions of Unix uh, and Linux, uh, BSD, modern Windows versions, uh, NT2000, those aren't really that modern anymore, but uh, you get the point, XP, Vista 7 and 8, 8.1, of course, and then OS X. Um, application software on the other end of spectrum of different types of software. So we've got operating system software. Application software are these, is the software that uh, refers to the programs that make the computer useful or entertaining to the user in some way. The operating system is not really that entertaining um, or useful as far uh, by itself. It doesn't really do anything except uh, run what's on the computer and delegate, uh, delegate tasks and uh, slice up resources. Application software provides a more specialized type of environment for the user to work in. Common software would be spreadsheets like uh, Microsoft Excel, word processors like Microsoft Word, accounting software like uh, Quicken, TurboTax like tax, uh, tax software, <clears throat> um, games, if you play Rome Total War or Civilizations or Empire Earth or um, World of Warcraft, these are all games that you could play. These are considered application software. They're not part of the fundamental uh, um, productivity or uh, maintenance of the computer, so they're not actually considered operating system software. They're useful to the user. <clears throat> the programming languages, we'll get into this now. A program, okay, we've been talking about programs all this time and applications. A program itself is a set of instructions a computer follows in order to perform a task. In order to get these instructions to the user, a programming language must be used. The programming language is a special language used to write these computer programs. A computer program is a set of instructions that enables the computer to solve a problem or perform a task. Collectively, these instructions are, uh, form what's known as an algorithm. Okay, algorithm. The definition they give in the book, and they give here, is an algorithm is a set of well-defined steps to, 
complete a task or completing a task. Um, I would say that an algorithm is a uh, well-defined, ordered sequence of steps to solve a problem, okay? Because the order does matter. Um, the steps in an algorithm, uh, algorithm are performed sequentially. They you know, kind of mention that, so that does imply or order. But here's where the problem occurs, where programming languages are concerned. A computer, regardless of how new your computer is, uh, needs the algorithm, the set of steps, it, the instructions to tell the CPU what to do, to be in machine language. Okay? Well, that's a problem because machine language is in binary. That means the binary numbering system, which is base 2, has only two digits of 0 and 1. They represent uh, off and on, uh, low and high, etc. So binary numbers are encoded as machine language. Each CPU has its own machine language, though. So the Motorola 68000 series processors, um, which I, I programmed with uh, pretty extensively when I, was in, um, when I was working on my bachelor's degree a long time ago, and I did the 6800 uh, when I was working on my master's. Um, I did some of that as well. Um, the Intel x86 series processors, uh, AMD uses that as well. Then you have the um, ARM processors. So an example of a machine language instruction would be this set of ones and zeros. In the distant past, programmers wrote programs in machine language. Um, this is why there were very few programmers, and they were all pretty uh, brilliant people, because they had to memorize all of the machine language instructions. Uh, programmers developed higher level programming language to make things easier. So the first of these were um, assembly languages. So assembly languages did make things easier, but they were also processor dependent. They had instructions like uh, move this byte there, um, multiply this value by that value and that register and the processor. They were still pretty low level, meaning they were still pretty close uh, to the processor. So because these assembly uh, language instructions were still very close to the processor, they were still pretty difficult to use. They were way better than using ones and zeros. Um, but programmers wanted to develop even higher level language that were closer to English. So um, when using the terminology, if this is your first programming course, a low level language does not mean easy and a high level language does not mean hard. In most circumstances, there, it's actually opposite. A low-level language means closer to the machine code um, of the particular processor. Now, that means if you are programming in machine code, that's pretty much the lowest you can get. It's the lowest level language you can get. High-level programming languages, on the other hand, um, are not processor dependent, and they're generally closer to English. Okay? Uh, some common programming languages Java, Basic, COBOL, Pascal, C, C++, C Sharp, PHP, Visual Basic, Python, Ruby, and JavaScript. Um, so far here, um, I've taught Java, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, and JavaScript. Um, these are all up for grabs. Some of these are more uh, web-related languages, uh, although Ruby and Python can be used as desktop. A lot of them are used more extensively in the web world. Some are more of teaching languages like Pascal, um, and uh, some are used in a lot of business logic or related stuff like COBOL. Um, <clears throat> there are some concepts that are common to virtually all programming languages, so um, definitely get used to these ideas because even if you take another programming language uh, like C Sharp, which I'm teaching this semester, or C++, which I, uh, I teach in online uh, segment of it in the summer, um, as well as Java 2, um, or if you deal with Visual Basic, which I usually teach in the fall, um, any of these, you're going to find some common concepts. Keywords, or reserved words, are a common concept uh, to programming languages. So, these are several, um, there are several keywords that you uh, have in a particular language like Java. Operators are um, things like the equal symbol and multiplication symbol, which is like an asterisk, like a star. 
um, addition symbol, things like that. Those are all operators. You also have punctuation. Um, when you have a programming statement, you have to end it with a semicolon, for example. You have programmer-defined identifiers. These are <clears throat> not built into the programming language itself, but they are de uh, defined by the programmer. And then you have the strict syntactic rules, which is called the syntax, or the grammar of the language. This is an example of um, a program written in Java. Okay, you have different keywords in Java, for example, public, the keyword static, the keyword void. Um, you have a programmer defined uh, identifier named message. You have the data type of the identifier, string. Um, you have a string literal, hello world, and you have punctuation. You have the semicolon at the end. You also are able to print out a message to the console using this syntax. In fact, if we go into Eclipse for a second, I'm going to create a new project real quick for you. So I'm going to go to File, New, Java Project. I'm going to just call it um, Lecture 2 Example. I generally, you can leave everything the same. Java uh, 1.7 is fine. Um, hit next, hit finish. You have SRC here, uh, which is a source folder. So if you expand that, you'll see the source folder. <clears throat> there are a couple different ways to add a source file to it, but let's do it this way. I'm going to right click the source folder, go to new, and then go to class. That's how you create a new source folder. Source, source file, sorry. Um, I'm going to call this um, test. Oops. I'll just call it test. And notice it says the use of the default package is discouraged. Um, package naming we'll get into a little bit uh, at another occasion um, later. Uh, but usually use what's called reverse uh, DNS or reverse URL notation. So it looks like a website. You don't have to own the website. Just put com dot, for example, um, prof JP Baugh, and then usually the name of the program, usually all lowercase. So that's non-default. That basically allows you to distinguish your package from uh, your Java package from other packages within Java. Um, we know the superclass right here. Everything in Java inherits from object. So if you're familiar with another programming language, that may make sense to you a little bit. I'm going to click Finish, and it gives me this blank, empty class that has nothing in it. Well, in Java, we have keywords like public, static, see how they're turning purple, um, void, main, string, args. I'm going to say int num equals 10, and then I'm just going to say system.out.print when I say the number is, and then I'm going to put num. All right, so I followed the basic syntactic rules here. I've got uh, the package at the top, which lists what package we're in. This was generated by the compiler, so the name of the class. And then you have the what's called the uh, entry point um, of the program. It's the main. Uh, method, so it has a special name, main, and it has the keywords public, static, and void in front of it. Uh, int is also a keyword because it, it's a fundamental data type in Java. Num, however, is a programmer defined identifier. I named it num. I named this variable num. I said it's going to hold an integer, and then I filled it with the value 10. Then I completed this statement with a semicolon. Uh, subsequently, I wrote system.out.println, and then in parentheses, I put a string literal here with a little space in it. It says the number is, and then a space, and then this plus symbol, and then num. In this context, the plus symbol means I want it to append whatever the number is to this string here. It's not going to try to add the numbers. In this case, when you're uh, taking a string and you're appending something to it, we call that string concatenation, but we'll talk about that later. Um, Java, or at least Eclipse, um, the Eclipse IDE automatically compiles um, this code, so we can actually run it. 
If you go up to the top, you'll notice that we have the run test.java button. Um, I'm going to click it and very quickly I see down at the bottom in the console it says the number is 10. It's exactly what we expect because that's the code. Um, so that's a very, very simple introduction to Java. Make sure that yours uh, works. Make sure you can start a, 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 a program by yourself project. Um, notice the keywords again, public, static, uh, also class. I uh, neglected to mention class. Class is also another keyword. Uh, and void. These keywords are lowercase. Java is a case sensitive language, meaning that if you do something with a capital C, C-L-A-S-S, -S, it's not the same as lowercase C-L-A-S-S. -S. Uh, keywords cannot be used as program defined identifiers. So I can't in my Java program say int class or int public and, and want to make public or class my identifier for the, for the variable. I can't do that uh, because those are reserved words or keywords. Semicolons are used to end Java statements, but note that not all lines of a Java program uh, end a statement. Part of learning Java is learning where to properly use the punctuation. Um, if we look at this example, there's also difference, differences between lines and statements. Um, you'll note that system.out.println with an open parenthesis is on one line, and then you have message a close parenthesis and a semicolon on the next line. So this is two lines, but it's only one statement because it ends with the semicolon here. So you can break it up. Most people don't unless it's absolutely necessary um, or if it makes the code look more readable. Um, variables are also used in a very large number of programming languages. Data in Java. now. No, we've, we've tried to make a distinction between data and instructions. Data in a Java program is stored in memory. Variable names represent a location in the memory. These uh, variable names we also call identifiers. Okay. Uh, variables in Java are sometimes called fields <clears throat> if they're class level variables. Variables are created by the programmer who assigns it a programmer defined identifier. Uh, int hours equals 40. What I did earlier was int num equals 10. My programmer defined identifier is num. Okay, so variables are simply a name given to represent a place in memory. So basically I could say int length equals 72. This, when you declare int length, um, the compiler will ultimately reserve you some memory once it's executed. Um, the, run the JVM will actually decide where the value is placed in memory, so not the, not the compiler, the JVM. Um, the compiler will uh, recognize this name, and then when you run it, uh, the JVM will decide where the value is placed in memory. And so it'll basically link length to this uh, location 3 in memory here, and then it'll place the value 72 at that location. So this variable length, the variable length is a symbolic name for the memory location uh, 0x003. It's a lot easier to remember than that long string also, the, that hexadecimal value. A programmer writes Java programming statements for a program. These statements are known as the source code. Okay, A text editor is used to edit and save a Java uh, source code file. You could write your Java program in Notepad if you wanted to, or another very, very bare bones text editor and just save it with a dot java extension. Then later you could go into the command line and call the Java um, compiler, which uh, you can actually install a command, it's Java C for Java compiler, and then give it the name of the source file and it will actually create the bytecode. But integrated development environments like Eclipse have everything here for you. Um, source code files have a Java extension. The compiler is the program that translates the source code into an executable form. Um, the compilers run using a source code file as input. Syntax errors, meaning if you left off a semicolon, if you left off a parenthesis, if you accidentally used a keyword as a, um, an identifier, these are all syntax errors. Syntax errors are the mistakes that the programmer has made that violate the rules of the programming languages. Okay, so if you if you have bad grammar in Java, the compiler will not let you get away with it. 
you have to correct the syntax errors before you move on. So the compiler creates another file once the syntax errors have been uh, remedied, which holds the translated instructions. Now here's where a distinction occurs between Java and many other uh, compilers for other languages. Most compilers translate the source code, like the written code like we've uh, written right here. This is the source code okay, that we wrote. Um, or in some cases, some of it might be generated for us, but most compilers, like C++ compiler, for example, most of them, um, translate source code into executable files directly containing the machine code for the processor on the platform that you're on. However, remember earlier we were talking about how um, the inventors part of the green team wanted to have a universal language, so James Gosling, the green team's leader, uh, lead engineer created this language so that um, instead of translating the code into machine code on a platform, the Java compiler actually translates the code into bytecode instructions. Then you take the bytecode to a bunch of different machines on different platforms, different processors, doesn't matter, and as long as that machine has the Java virtual mas machine or the JVM installed, it will run through the JVM and then the JVM will uh, uh, run it on the uh, computer. So basically the, or on the CPU, the bytecode instructions in with .class file. The cool thing about Java is I could take my .class file that I p compiled on Windows um, with all the architecture architectural differences on the Intel processor. I take that, I can take that byte file, run it on a Mac, I could take it and run it on something with a completely different processor, uh, like a RISC processor, ARM processor, what have you. I could uh, move this class file around, and uh, since it's bytecode, it will run as long as those other platforms have a JVM installed. So basically, the JVM is a program that emulates a microprocessor. So you can think of bytecode as the quote-unquote machine code for the JVM, and the JVM is this universal computer. On one end it has the input for the bytecode, on the other end it's running, it's specifically programmed by Sun Microsystems, specifically Oracle now because Oracle owns them, um, but it runs on the particular process or particular platform that it was programmed for. So the JVM is often called an interpreter because it interprets the bytecode line by line. Uh, some people call Java an interpreted language. It's a language. It's actually more appropriate to call it a hybrid language because it does compilation and interpretation. So compilation converts um, the converts the code ahead of time into some sort of other format. In Java's case, it takes all the source code and converts it into a bunch of binary or a bunch of byte code all at once. Um, and then you have this byte code sitting there. Interpreters, on the other hand, uh, interpreters read line by line. They don't uh, take the whole thing and then execute the whole thing. They read line by line in the um, interpreted scenario. So what we've got is the bytecode being run on the JVM and then the JVM uh, translates it into the or interprets it on the CPU of the uh, host system. So you've got the text editor. Uh, we have a text editor built into um, Eclipse. This run this uh, saves the Java statements as a .java file. So this is basically a .java file. As you can see, it says test.java here. Um, <clears throat> that is read by the Java compiler and produces the bytecode, which is a class file. Then that's interpreted by the JVM and results in program execution. Down here on the console here, we actually have the result of the execution of the code. Okay, so. It's very nice for us. The Eclipse is very nice for us. Um, another issue with Java that we've alluded to and talked about a little bit is portability. Portable means that the program may be written on one type of computer and then run on a wide variety of computers with little or no modification. Java bytecode runs on the JVM as, and not on any particular CPU. Therefore, compiled Java programs are what we call highly portable. So JVMs, the JVMs, though, exist on several different platforms, Windows, Unix, BSD, Mac, Linux, different flavors of Linux. Um, there's all kinds of platforms that you can run Java on with the same bytecode. 
With most programming languages, portability is achieved by compiling a program for each CPU it will run on. For example, if I write a, uh, a program in C++ or C, uh, which I did extensively when I worked at Siemens as a software engineer, you compile this code, but you have to basically send the code out and have it um, autom uh, go through a system. You either do it manually or have a system do it for you and compile it on each of the platforms independently to generate the machine code. Uh, this can be a problem uh, sometimes because it uh, involves a lot of extra work. Java provides the JVM for each platform so that the programs do not have to recompile for different platforms. You just take the bytecode, uh, put it in the uh, write it on one system, comp uh, compile it into bytecode, and then you can send it to someone else with a completely different system and it will run on their system um, if they have the JVM installed. All right. Uh, there are different versions of Java. Um, the software you use to write Java programs is called the JDK, Java Development Kit. The different versions are SE, which is the Standard Edition, Enterprise Edition, uh, and Micro Edition. This is uh, kind of for smaller items that are available for download at java.sun.com. Um, Eclipse uh, will probably uh, warn you if you don't have it included. I think Eclipse will, a well, actually, Eclipse will <clears throat> force you to install it if you don't already have it installed, because Eclipse is actually written in Java 2, I believe. Um, so how do you compile a Java program? Well, we've seen how to do it in Eclipse. You just basically, it does it automatically, and then you hit the uh, run test to, uh, to actually run it. But if you have the JDK installed and you go to a command line, so if you went here and then you type CMD, um, you can go in here and type your commands in there. Okay? Uh, go, you can go to the folder. If you feel really comfortable with the command line, you can get used to using that. You would call Java. Um, oh, that's not right. That should be Java C. Java C uh, file name Java. So Java C is the Java compiler. Um, the .java file extension must be used. So for example, to compile a Java uh, source code file, um, you would use the command Java C payroll.java. If payroll.java is the source file, it will generate a payroll.class. Okay, so that's that's your portable bytecode. Um, Eclipse does the same thing. Um, it, um, if I go into the working directory and look at my lecture two example, um, in bin, and then if I follow the um, the uh, package name here, I ultimately have this test.class file here. If I sent this to someone else on a completely different platform, um, this is the bytecode right here. So they could run it on their Java virtual machine. It's pretty cool, actually. So the programming process, you want to clearly define what the program is to do, visualize the program running on your computer, use design tools to create a model of the program, and then check the model for logical errors. Enter the code and compile it, correct any errors found during compilations, and then re compilation, and then repeats, uh, repeat steps five and six as many times as necessary. Run the program with test data for input, correct any runtime errors found uh, while running the program. These could be um, errors that the compiler doesn't catch, but they, you can still have errors in your code. So just because the compiler says you're okay does not necessarily mean you're okay. We'll get into that as we get deeper into the course. Software engineering is more than just programming. Okay, Software engineering encompasses the whole process of crafting computer software. Software engineers perform several tasks in the development of complex software projects, including designing, writing, testing, debugging, documenting, modifying and maintaining. So basically it's not just uh, sitting there brainlessly writing a bunch of code um, or just writing code. You want to be able to design it effectively because sometimes there can be design flaws. You might program it perfectly but maybe there was just a bad design. Um, you have to make sure that you design your software effectively. Uh, writing the code or implementing the software is one thing. Another thing, testing it as thoroughly as possible um, most companies, especially with large-scale software, have actual people who do pretty much nothing but test them. So once, but you as the developer, as the software engineer, should test the code as thoroughly as possible before you release it, even to be tested by others, because you want to reduce the number of bugs um, in your code. Debugging is you find a bug, uh, you track down the bugs, and then remove them. Documenting is saying. Uh, what did you change between this and the last version, or what are the new features, 
Um, there's all kinds of things you could document. Also putting comments, which we'll get to next week. Uh, modifying and maintaining. That's pretty self-explanatory. Software engineers develop program specifications, diagrams of the screen output, diagrams representing the program components and flow of data, pseudocode, which um, before you actually sit down and code uh, <clears throat> software, sometimes it's useful to sit down and write out um, English or s kind of English natural language description of how the algorithms work, like um, uh, mix mix the eggs and the flour and then put it in the, uh, put it in a uh, cake pan, then put it in the oven, then close the door. That's English. How do you put that in code? Um, obviously, that's uh, baking something, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. You want it in English first, then you look at it and say, well, how am I going to accomplish this in code? But putting it in pseudocode first is often very helpful. Um, examples of expected input and desired output. Software engineers also use special software design for testing programs. Most complex or co most commercial software applications are large and complex. Usually a team of programmers, not a single individual, develops them. Program requirements are thoroughly analyzed and divided into subtasks and are handled by individual teams and then individuals within the team. Um, when I worked at Siemens and when I've worked on other projects with other individuals, either in my academic career or also on collaborative projects, uh, doing freelance programming and all kinds of different stuff, you often have uh, situations where you want to uh, break the <clears throat> tasks down for the different members of the team. Okay, it's very, very frequently the case, especially with large programs. Procedural programs. Older programming languages were procedural. A procedure is a set of programming language statements that together uh, form a specific task. Uh, procedures typically operate on data items that are separate from the procedures in a procedure program, procedure program, the data items are commonly passed from one procedure to the other. Okay, so you have procedure A giving the data element, uh, returning a data element, giving it to procedure B. In procedure programming, procedures are developed to operate on the program's data. Data in the program tends to be global to the entire pro uh, entire program. That means if we have variables that all the methods or all the functions have access to data formats might change and thus the procedures that operate on the data have to change also. So it's not very flexible. So later on, uh, software engineers developed object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is centered on creating objects rather than procedures. So the, the main component of object-oriented programming are the objects. Objects are a melding of data and procedures that manipulate the data. Data in an object are known as the object's attributes procedures in an object are known as the methods in Java. Okay, So you have an object which has attributes and then methods. So we call the methods the uh, behaviors and procedures. We call the data, or the attributes, characteristics, all kinds of different names. We'll definitely get in uh, more deeply into this as we go along. So if a lot of this seems over your head or you're getting a headache already, don't worry about it. You'll definitely do okay. Um, Object-oriented programming combines data and behavior via what we call encapsulation. Um, so you encapsulate the data and the behavior together in one single object, and you treat that object like its own entity. Data hiding is the ability of an object to hide the data from the other objects in the program. Uh, data and also instructions in many cases, um, so you have information hiding. Um, only an object method, object's methods uh, should be able to, oops, only an object's method should be able to directly manipulate it, its attributes. Other objects are allowed uh, to manipulate an object's attributes via the object's methods. So basically, one object defines an interface that other objects can interact with, and they can only interact through that programming interface. Okay, let me give you an example uh, here of what it looks like. Other objects have to go through the interface. This other object outside of my object cannot just grab, uh, willy-nilly grab data inside of my object. So if I have an object representing a person um, and I have um, a method that allows them to enter the salary for that employee or person or what have you, um, I'm not going to let the outside world just grab the data and make it a negative number or set it to zero. Maybe there's restrictions on what values could be a valid salary. There's all kinds of things you can prevent the outside world from doing by 
forcing the outside world to access your attributes or your internal data via methods or procedures. All right. Um, so that's that's pretty much what I have for you this week. Uh, make sure that you read through the slides and read through the chapter. Um, I would recommend um, for this week just basically make sure that you have Eclipse installed. Uh, do have Eclipse installed and go through the chapter and then there are several examples or a few examples I guess uh, different code listings such as payroll.java on page 10 um, that you can look through and try to get an idea of what the uh, what the code uh, looks like. Um, they do actually use JGrasp uh, in here as well so if you wanted even to download JGrasp and play around with that too that's fine uh, but just know that um, you'll be turning things in uh, with Eclipse uh, projects. So, All right, so uh, have a great day and great week, and hopefully uh, everything will be good uh, next week. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or post on the discussion boards. Uh, thank you very much.